session. So thank you uh, for joining us tonight for our October membership meeting. We're so glad to have you here tonight. Uh, we're very pleased to have a public health panel uh, presenting um, after uh, the business part of our meeting. And so um, that'll be, uh, we're, we're hoping somewhere around 725 or so, but um, we'll go through our business items first and then we'll, we'll get to that. Um, also, Brian, did you want to mention about the chat? Oh, yes. Um, so to prepare for our public health panel, um, if you have any questions that you would like to share with the panel, you can add them at any time throughout um, this meeting this evening in the chat. So go ahead and add your questions as you think of them, and um, we will be addressing those during the public health panel. So we had a very, very, very busy past month here with the with the PTSA and, and at Wooten. So we had a really uh, exciting uh, month of activities, uh, starting with the college fair, which was excellent. It was in the front driveway. The weather was just perfect. Uh, we had a great turnout, not only with our college reps, but with um, um, all of our students and parents coming out to, to, to meet with the college reps. We had vendors that were participating uh, that helped uh, PTSA raise funds. Um, they were all useful vendors for uh, families to get college services. And they, um, they, they did speak to a lot of families. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to help our families with the types of services that you may uh, need, but just not know where to look. So it was an excellent college fair um, and, and thank you to Wooten for, for all the support on, on such a great fair. It was a lot of work. Um, the next event that, that uh, we put together pretty quickly was the Wooten Cluster Fall Festival. Um, it was the first time that we ever held a cluster festival um, and, and our Wooten Cluster includes nine schools total, including Wooten. We have six elementary schools and two middle schools and, um, and it was just great to, to see um, our families and students from all those different um, uh, school levels, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, we had a lot of Wooten students who presented their, they, they had uh, their club tables. We had many performances that were fantastic. And we had um, the Patriot Ambassadors National, <clears throat> excuse me, National Honor Society had trunks um, to give out candy to the children who were there, who dressed in costume. It was a really fun and exciting event. And again, uh, we had great weather. The weather held out. It looked like it may rain and it turned into a really beautiful day. So, um, you know, we were very lucky, but it was a really fun event. Everyone had a great time and we're hoping to do that um, again next fall. And then finally, uh, homecoming this past weekend was amazing. Um, it was a great start to the weekend with uh, homecoming festivities with the football game, uh, with Wooten winning 35 to nothing over Whitman. That was one of the most exciting Wooten football games I've been to. Uh, and I've been to quite a few, so that was really exciting. Um, and there was just so much excitement uh, in the air with, with homecoming. And then the next night with the dance, um, the rain ended just in time for the dance out in the stadium. And uh, it was just great. Uh, there were 800 tickets sold. Um, I was there for a little bit and, and there was a lot of excitement and it was really fun. Um, I wanna thank all the volunteers that came out to help us um, give out snacks and water from the concession stand and some, some folks helped to decorate as well. And I wanna thank all those that donated snacks and water. We had a huge amount. So, um, the, the week before, it didn't look like we had that much, and we ended up getting so much by the end. So we, we really appreciate it. We donated any leftover snacks um, and water to the faculty, so they have some stuff, uh, you know, um, that they'll be able to enjoy in the faculty lounge. So so thank you for all, for all the volunteers and, and the snacks and water. Next slide. So for some upcoming events that we have um, for our next meeting, that's gonna be on Tuesday, November 16th at 7 p.m. Um, our topic is gonna to be college admissions in SAT and ACT testing. And we're gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna present two parts to the testing. One uh, is what 
um, what are the requirements in a lot of the colleges for SAT and ACT testing? There's a lot of changes due to COVID. Um, and then uh, a lot of parents and students are trying to figure out which of those tests should I take? Should I take the ACT or the SAT? So we wanna help with both of those questions for you to learn about the, the college admission requirements in the time of COVID. What are the admission requirements? Do they require ACT and SATs? And then how do I figure out if I take the ACT or the SAT? What, what, what are the options? What, what do I have to weigh to figure that out? We wanna, we're gonna provide those experts to help you um, with that question. Um, then we uh, we our fundraising committee and we have a new we have a new fundraising committee and our fundraising committee is uh, is planning some really fun events throughout the entire year and we the the first event that we're going to be holding is is going to be a holiday fair uh, we have uh, over 20 vendors already participating probably will be quite a few more um, we're in the early stages so we're working on on figuring out when the best uh, evening will be. And so once we figure that out, we're going to um, let everybody know the date and the location. It'll be at Wooten, but we just don't know exactly where at Wooten yet. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. And then our December PTSA meeting, uh, this meeting, it's going to be on Tuesday, December 21st at 7. Um, it's always a popular meeting because we, we have a chance to bring our alumni back and we have an alumni panel with recent grads. It's so exciting to hear what they've done in school during the first semester and they share with our um, upcoming, our students, our rising uh, seniors and rising juniors, um, what kind of experience they're having in these various colleges. So it's a really good chance to hear directly from students that just experienced their first semester of college. Next slide. So we do have some um, vacancies uh, remaining. Uh, we were able to fill a number of positions and we're very pleased about that. So um, we, we still have the Latino Parent Student Network liaison position that's open. Uh, we have the fundraising, well, we have a fundraising committee that I just mentioned, but we do need some members on the committee. Right now we have two people, a chair and one committee member. We'd love to add a couple more committee members at least to the committee. Uh, and they're gonna be planning a, a number of really fun events throughout the year. Um, and even if you don't have that much time, you may be able to at least participate in the committee, share your ideas. Um, once we have the ideas, we're going to, you know, other members of the PTSA will be helping with um, setting up and create and uh, implementing those ideas. Uh, we have um, a student engagement committee. We have a chair, but we don't have committee members. So if you're interested in student engagement, please, um, you know, join as a student engagement committee member. And still remaining is the Montgomery County Council PTA's Wooten Cluster Coordinator position. We have two Wooten Cluster Coordinators. But we do need one more. Um, they're responsible for um, managing the nine PTS, PTAs and PTSAs within our cluster, as well as testimony and a number of other cluster-wide activities. Uh, and there are cluster meetings that they lead during the year. And, uh, and then finally, a parliamentarian. And we can move to the next slide. Um, so I've talked a little bit about this in the past. Um, so the Board of Education Capital Improvement Program testimony will be coming up for the Wooten Cluster. It's gonna be on Thursday, November 4th. Uh, there's two nights of public testimony. Wooten Cluster was assigned to November 4th. Um, what we've done in the past is we've been, uh, we've been able to get students um, from our SGA to testify. And they, they testify on all the different um, areas uh, they coordinate their testimony with one another. And um, so they're, they're working on their testimony now. And we look forward to getting them registered. So registration will be opening up on Monday. Um, I'm just trying to, it's hard to find the information, but it looks like it's Monday at noon uh, that the registration will open. And what I usually do since it's during the school day is I get some help and we get those students registered. And I believe there's going to be four students uh, testifying, but I'm, I'm confirming that. Um, and then um, for, certainly for parents that are interested in tes uh, testifying, um, you could sign up as well. Um, we do want to make sure that we've coordinated our testimony. So the CIP, for those that don't know, the Capital Improvement Program, is that this is the facility budget. This is the budget that handles the, the, the facilities of all the schools and anything that uh, goes along with the facility. So that's the Capital Improvement Program. It's on a six-year cycle. 
Um, and Wooten is in the CIP for renovation for um, 2024, uh, which means that uh, the design should be, we should be hearing about that hopefully maybe by next year. Um, but um, there's a lot of questions about the renovation. And so we, we, we really want to make sure the Board of Education knows how desperately we need uh, an improved building. We need to have our renovation. And back in 2019, they were due to break ground to uh, completely renovate Wooten uh, facility. And then that got pushed out for five years. So we're going to work really hard to keep it on track for the time for 2024, but we really want to make sure that we get the full renovation that is needed for, for, for our 1970 building. So it really is aging and it's showing its age. And so, uh, and we're one of three high schools in Montgomery County built before 1980 that have not been renovated. It's just Magruder, Poolsville, and Wooten. Um, Poolsville was supposed to go after us and now um, they kind of leapfrogged us and now Wooten is gonna go after uh, Poolsville. So we wanna keep us on track. Uh, we do have other schools in our cluster that have not been renovated that really need work as well. Um, so we are uh, making sure that our, our cluster schools know that if parents are interested in testifying about their schools, that we welcome that as well. And uh, there will be a cluster meeting coming up on the 27th prior to the testimony. So we'll be talking, uh, those that attend the cluster meeting will be talking a lot about, about that. So if you're interested in testifying, um, look for the link uh, on the Board of Education website at, at 12 noon on, on the 25th, which is Monday. Oh, no, no, sorry, 25th is not Monday. Is it Monday? Oh yeah, 25th is Monday. So on Monday at noon, you can go in and um, and it's, if I can find the link, which I will look for, we'll send it out through the PTSA in the case anybody is interested in testifying. Uh, before I pass it along, are there any questions for me? All right, so then I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Nikki. Nikki, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, we're uh, over a year into this and I'm still on mute. Uh, so uh, just a quick membership update. Um, you can see on the slide, uh, numbers are doing well. We haven't quite reached our 1920 uh, year, which is kind of what we hope to surpass since last year was the pandemic year. Um, so you can still purchase a membership. The, the website is here on the screen. Hooten PTSA is our website. Um, so very easy to purchase a membership and I'm always happy to help. You can always email me if you need help purchasing a membership. Um, I also wanted to just take a moment to talk about our mock testing that we offer. Um, I sent an, a, out an email earlier this week about this. Um, so we partner with three companies. These are the same three companies as last year, Potomac Oak Tutoring, Everest Tutors and Test Prep and Potomac Education Center. Um, so they offer the, the mock testing. It's $20 for one test, $30 if you want to do two. Um, but they all have a variety of offerings. Um, so for instance, Potomac Oak, they offer in-person tests every Sunday. They also offer self-proctored tests that you can do anytime you want. Everest will work with your schedule to do an in-person or a virtual test. And uh, Potomac Education Center um, has specific dates that they hold their tests. And so all of that information um, is available on our website. There's a YouTube tutorial as well that shows you how to sign up for those. And again, you can always reach out to me if you have questions on the testing. Um, so next I am going to hand it over to Jen. She's gonna talk a little bit about our um, Holiday Helping Hands program that I help her out with that we started last year and um, give you a little more information about what to expect this year. Jen, we can't hear you. No. Okay, well, um, we'll see if Jen can get her sound working, but I can, um, sorry, I've advanced the slide and trying to help her with that. Um, so I'll go back here and I'll just give you a quick update on the, the program. So last year was our first year that we did the holiday program. 
And so kind of in a rush with kind of less than a month, we, we threw it all together. We raised money and, and Jen and I did all of the shopping pretty much. We had a few people that also did help us out with shopping, but we did most of it. We delivered all of these gifts um, and it was very successful, but incredibly stressful and very time consuming. And so now that we have a little bit of time this year, we've been doing some planning um, and we are gonna start the process earlier this year and get more help. Um, and so what we're gonna transition to this year is rather than adopting a family, we're gonna make it so that you can adopt a child. And um, we're gonna put together gift registries to make it simpler uh, for those people who, I know there were a lot of people last year who were like, what do I buy? Or I haven't had a small child in a long time. And so um, to kind of facilitate that, we're gonna put together uh, gift registries for each child and you can purchase right off of those registries um, and to make things a lot simpler. Um, and so we're gonna be putting all that information up on the Wooten website as soon as we have it. Right now, we've sent out forms to all of the counselors and PPWs in our um, cluster. And so they are reaching out to the families in need that they are aware of and um, gathering the information that we need in order to put those together. Um, so we will be staying in touch and letting everyone know as soon as we have um, that information ready. Um, we're hoping to have it done mid-November um, to allow everyone to get shopping done um, by early December, and we're planning to do gift wrapping mid-December. Mid um, and we will have opportunity uh, opportunities for SSL hours for gift wrapping as well that we will be putting out for students. Um, so I think that's all we were going to talk about with the holiday program. And so, Ms. Bolden, I am going to throw it over to you for um, whatever updates you would like to share so much. Hello, everyone. It's so great to see you this evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to echo what uh, Brian and Nikki started. It has been a tremendous uh, fall so far and lots of great things happening in our school and particularly in the PTSA. And a huge, huge thank you for um, the fall festival, college fair, homecoming. On the staff side, PTSA has been busy spoiling us with coffees uh, after back to school night and um, a number of other uh, treats for the staff as well and gearing up for um, the uh, grants for both students and staff. So I just can't thank you enough for all of, of what happens through the PTSA. Um, and in addition to that, we also had lots of senior parents come out and help serve um, lunch for our students when they were taking their panoramic picture, which was also fabulous and just a lot of happenings. Um, in terms of the where we are, I can't believe the first quarter will be ending on November 4th. I uh, just wanted to let you know we're just a couple weeks out from the um, end of the first marking period. Um, our students have adjusted and continue to acclimate back to school after um, not being there for a, a long period of time. Um, we are noticing that they are enthusiastic. <laughs> they're ready to participate. They're ready to engage both in and outside of the classroom. So turnout to events has just been really wonderful. Um, of course, we are keeping in mind our COVID protocols. And so um, anytime we're having something, we also think about what it, where we currently are in terms of um, the pandemic and try to plan accordingly with our students and our staff and of course the PTSA. So I also just thank you all very much for your flexibility and your adaptability as we continue to um, figure out outdoor events. <laughs> um, but uh, we've, we've just really been um, doing just a great deal over this first marking period. As I mentioned, the first quarter will end November 4th. Um, and just check in with your students. This is about that time where you're checking in, engaging as you've been doing, how they're doing over the course of the quarter and, and where there are those areas that they're going to, you know, continue to um, have some challenges and maybe want to check in with their teachers a little bit more um, and just making sure that their work is in and that, and also, of course, that you're checking in in terms of the, how um, they're managing their time and that they're not feeling too overwhelmed by the end of the first quarter. We always like to keep an eye on that as we move towards the end of the first marking period. Uh, we have been doing a lot of testing in the building. Uh, we have an October window of testing for uh, essentially state exams or MCAP exams. Um, the state and the county were playing a little bit of catch up. So a lot of the, the, the uh, tests that your students have been taking over the last two weeks 
um, have been either because they were eighth graders last year and they had to take their end of um, end of year tests then, or because we uh, pushed pause on all testing last year due to the pandemic. So we've already tested the MCAT English um, exam for some students. Uh, we did math on Monday, and tomorrow we're gearing up for the biggest administration of MISA or our science um, MCAT test tomorrow. We're testing approximately 1,900 students. And so we are asking that students come on time, they bring their Chromebook fully charged. Um, we'll have signs and posters around the building uh, to help them navigate because essentially we're te testing um, the majority of our students. And again, for our rising, for our ninth graders, this is the test that they would have taken during their eighth grade year, their science test in their eighth grade year and 10 through 12, this is the graduation requirement um, in order to um, graduate. So we're trying to capture as many of our students during this October test as we possibly can. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, uh, administered the PSAT for our sophomores and juniors primarily last week and the SAT for some of our seniors who were unable to sit for um, one of the exams. So it is test heavy right now. Hopefully at the end of this week, um, we will be doing some makeups for students who missed it. And then we will have a bit of normalcy in our schedule um, for the remaining weeks for the end of the quarter. But I thank you for your patience and your understanding uh, regarding the testing. Our next biggest test window, of course, will come in the spring again um, between APs and MCAT testing. And of course, we'll communicate all of that out to you. And I guess I would say my final update um, Mr. Rohner, our principal intern, he will um, transition and, to, and do his, practic uh, his intern practicum starting in December and January. Um, I found out that I'll be going to Rachel Carson Elementary um, during that time period. Um, and so you'll be hearing much more from Mr. Rohner as he prepares to uh, take over Wooten um, for those two months. Um, so again, I just, I think those are my updates. And again, I can't thank you all enough for this great partnership and really coming back to this uh, year in fine style and offering some really, really great events for our students and for our community. Um, I'm truly grateful. And I also just wanna say thank you to our panelists uh, joining us this evening. Um, so appreciate your expertise and your time. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Rabin. Thank you, and um, and so now we'll, we'll move into our public health panel. So we're we're very pleased to have uh, an expert panel here. So I'm going to turn it over to Shruti Chappi, who's a senior associate scientist at the National Institute of Mental Health at the National Institutes of Health, where she conducts cognitive neuroscience research on how the human brain processes facial and body expressions. She has two boys. One is a sophomore at Wooten, and the other is a seventh grader at, at uh, Cabin John. So, Shruti. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Okay, great. Awesome. So, I see that our panelists are here already, which is great. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the PTSA to, um, because they have. We did a panel like this, I think, uh, back in the spring, perhaps, and it was a great opportunity for parents to ask questions and just kind of, you know, in a very informal setting, get uh, information that's valid and accurate. And so um, it's great that we're able to do this again. Um, I do want to say that uh, we have a the panelists today come from various backgrounds, um, so they have uh, different fields of study. Uh, we'll, I'm, I'm going to quickly introduce them to you, but I want to stress at the beginning that they're all here, um, not as spokespersons of their uh, jobs. They are here uh, voicing their opinions uh, as uh, private citizens. So anything that they say is essentially their own view and not their employers. Okay, so with that disclaimer, let me just start off by first introducing um, Dr. Amy Kreimer. I hope I said that name right. Great. Uh, she's also from the NIH. Um, she's a senior investigator uh, at the National Cancer Institute. She has a PhD in epidemiology, so, uh, so a field that is very, very uh, important these days. 
Um, and uh, she essentially studies infectious causes of cancer with a special focus on HPV, which is, um, as all of us as high school parents uh, know about the HPV vaccine for the human papilloma virus. And um, she has been involved in many trials, uh, clinical trials of the HPV vaccine. So if you have questions about HPV vaccine, you're welcome to ask those. She, and given that she has experience with clinical trials uh, with vaccine, she can also answer some questions about the COVID vaccine trials. Um, she has three kids in the Wooden Cluster, a high schooler at Wooden, a middle schooler at Frost, and then an elementary schooler at Falls Mead. So Dr. Kramer, would you, Kramer, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, just jump in and uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a great introduction. Please okay. go ahead with everyone else. Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, um, and I'd like to introduce our next panelist, uh, Ms. Iran Nakvi. Iran, I hope I didn't butcher that, your last name. Okay, great. Um, so Iran is actually in the public health space and uh, she's currently the Deputy Director of Strategic Initiatives Division uh, within the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, which is in the Health Resources and Services Administration, um, which is part of the federal government, DHHS, Health and Human Services. Um, and as a public health leader, she has been most recently involved in um, uh, the readiness and technical assistance team for health center COVID-19 vaccine program. Um, and she has helped actually execute uh, the federal government's American Rescue Plan Act to administer vaccine doses nationwide. Uh, she has a special emphasis on adolescent population um, as well. So if you have questions also uh, with regards to um, how to tar targeted vaccines in this population, she'll be able to handle some of those. Uh, she also has worked with children in the past with special health care needs. So Iran, would you like to add anything to that? Only that I, my first job is mom and chief, and I have a ninth grader at Wooten, and I have a seventh grader at the Siena School. Awesome. Yeah. Right. And uh, just to indicate how Miss um, Nakwi's background is, um, she has a master's in health science from Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and she has an MBA from Michigan State University. Awesome. Okay. So moving on to our third panelist, we have Dr. Dr. Meredith Shields. She is also at the NIH. She's a senior investigator um, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, she has a PhD in cancer epidemiology. So again, um, epidemiology is the buzzword these days. Uh, she also has a master's in health sciences. Um, and her research uses large public health databases to track disease and death rates in the US. And in the recent past, she has been also working on um, she has uh, three kids, uh, three future wooden patriots, two at Falls Mead right now, and a preschooler. Meredith, would you like to add anything to that? I don't think so. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. Awesome. All right. And uh, rounding out our panel today, we have uh, Dr. Chris Gizzi, and I think I said that right this time. Um, she is currently a deputy medical examiner uh, she, uh, in Washington, DC, and she obtained her medical degree from Medical College of Wisconsin, and she's trained in forensic pathology. So she will bring a unique perspective to our panel today. Uh, among other things, she can tell us about what the disease actually does to the body, which, is, um, which will be an interesting take. So uh, Dr. Gizzi, anything to add? No, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for okay, having me. Okay, awesome. All right. Okay, so while people are thinking about questions, I invite parents to please put your questions in the chat um, and then I can uh, bring them up for panel discussion. But I would like to start us off by talking about something that everybody is thinking about for sure. I, I definitely am, uh, which is boosters for COVID-19. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna kind of open it up I feel free to jump in, unmute yourselves and just kind of take the question where you feel comfortable. I, I don't necessarily have any one person in mind for any of these questions. So just feel free to jump in. Let's make it a dynamic discussion. Um, so questions you know, that come to my mind is, 
right now we have a couple of boosters um, that have been approved for certain segments of the population. So could somebody maybe take that one and just kind of describe what we have right now and what we could expect in the future with respect to boosters for everyone? So I'm happy to speak on the topic of boosters, but I'm gonna go a little bit of a different direction. Sure. Um, so again, I, you know, I do HPV vaccine research and I run multiple clinical trials. Um, and so when we do these clinical trials, you know, these are well thought out studies, very, you know, lots of people, people are blinded to what type of vaccine they're getting. You know, we pre-specify our primary aims, we have to show that the way we measure these outcomes are valid, that they're reliable. Like the whole process of the clinical trial is very formulaic. There's not a left, a lot of like, you know, how to interpret the data. Everything is very clear cut. Once those data become public domain, and those are, those are decisions not made by the investigators, not made by pharmaceutical companies, they have independent monitoring boards that can have no like financial you know, benefit from the vaccines at all. These are people free of conflict of interest. This goes to FDA and FDA is charged with evaluating safety and efficacy. That is their primary concern. And they have teams of people with expertise across biostatistics, virology, virology vaccinology, immunology, epidemiology, the whole gamut. And they say, is the vaccine safe and does it work? That's all FDA does. From there, it then goes to the CDC. The CDC takes this information and says, this is how the vaccine should be used. And a sidebar on that is that is also how the vaccine gets paid for within the public. And so as, like I said, I'm an expert in HPV vaccines. I run these clinical trials. I advise both CDC and the WHO on how these vaccines can be recommended, the HPV vaccines. I do not step outside my lane, even as an epidemiologist, even with vaccine knowledge, and make individual decisions about how boosters for COVID could be used. Because I could never know enough, because again, these whole teams make these decisions. I could never know enough as an individual, as a parent, as, a, as an epidemiologist who's really expert in this one body to, to say, should I do this or not? It's not this, you know, um, and you know, it's not for me to say who should and who should not. So can I review you know, what the current booster recommendations are? Sure, are they in flux? Absolutely. But should we be confident that when they come out and they are recommendations from CDC and FDA, they are you know, well-conceived and they are the, those are the recommendations we should follow. So that's kind of more my statement around these booster doses. And I can, you know, why do we need booster doses? Um, well, you know, we got two doses, two doses in short intervals. The, the immune system doesn't like short interviews, intervals. We, the immune system likes to get a dose and then and a dose of a vaccine like teaches the immune system. It's a tiny threat. That's not really a threat because it doesn't have like the DNA. It's not the virus, it's a tiny little threat. And it teaches the immune system how to react. And then if you show them the same threat again, it comes in big time. So if you do that one month apart, that big time response is a little smaller. So we knew going into it that one month between doses or even three weeks is not the ideal timing between doses for the immune system. But when risk is high of acquisition, when we know, you know what, let's get that second dose in and take some boost on those antibodies, versus waiting and possibly getting COVID in between, that's a risk benefit decision. Um, so that's why it totally was expected, in my opinion, that booster doses would be needed. It was not an ideal dosing regimen. We knew it was coming. They're seeing evidence of you know, some breakthrough or some waning immunity. Um, so you know, I, this was, I think, expected in the research community and the vaccine community, and it's coming. And so we're all gonna get our booster doses. Right, awesome. That was a really nice uh, summary of why we need boosters and um, how the immune system works. Um, if, does anybody else have anything to add to uh, the discussion of boosters? I mean, I know we have some that are approved right now for certain age groups and certain um, parts, uh, segments of the population. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, the FDA and the CDC will figure out at what point the boosters should be open to the rest of the population. 
Um, is there anything that you, you all might want to add in terms of uh, boosters when they do become available to the general public? Um, how, what the current information uh, tells us about cross-brand booster vaccination? Does that, um, and so like if I, I got the Moderna vaccine back in January, February, and um, so should I stick to the Moderna or, you know, can I take the Pfizer or if somebody took the J&J? &J? So just kind of like practical information. I know some of this just recently came out today or yesterday. And uh, so I'm just wondering if somebody wants to jump in and kind of recap that, um, make it more accessible. I can, but I'm happy to, I'm more happy to hear someone else talk about yeah. it. No, go for it. No, no, I think so, you might be the closest to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe even tomorrow we're going to hear about mixing and matching. I think the yeah. general idea of it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because again, I'm a little out of my lane with COVID, you know, I'm much happier to talk HPV vaccination. Um, it sounds like, you know, the, um, the public health community is asking for flexibility. It's really hard to talk boosters if you don't have something in stock, you know, and then again, you're seeing this risk. Is it better to give a mix and match or is it better to wait and like find that vaccine? So I do think we're going to see um, some language around mixing and matching. I think the recommendation will still be if you got Moderna, it's best to boost with Moderna. If you got Pfizer, it's best to boost with Pfizer. I think we will see there are data that showed that if you had J&J &J as your first dose, you can follow that up with Moderna. And I think the immune response is even bigger. So I think there's that, but please other people in the panel or you know, anyone back, you know, if you heard otherwise, but if you have J&J, &J, I think there'll be language that getting Moderna or something else will be um, recommended. And again, they're just trying to provide flexibility. But if you have Moderna and you can get another Moderna, do that. If you had Pfizer and you can get another Pfizer, do that. Okay. Yeah, I would have to. I would have to second that whole bot process. That's. Thank you very much for adding that. But I think um, right now it is very early, and we still are getting that information, and we should get it within the next few days. Right. Awesome. So, um, actually, you mentioned something as you were describing uh, boosters and how the immunity immune system works, and uh, you used the word breakthrough. So, and I have a question here from a parent who sent this question in a little bit earlier today. Um, about why breakthrough infections are actually referred as breakthrough. It, so the idea is, um, you know, the, vac the vaccines don't prevent disease. They reduce, you know, it's not like 100%, it's not a wall, it's not gonna keep the virus away. It's that it reduces your chance of severe disease, right? And um, so I guess the term breakthrough can be a little confusing uh, and I'm wondering if anybody wants to jump in and try to unpack that. Um, does breakthrough mean really that the vaccine didn't work or does it just mean that, you know, it's actually doing its job, it's, it's just gonna be a, not a severe case. So Ron, please. So I would, I would ask, you know, people to think of it like a flu vaccine, right? Um, there is never a hundred percent chance that you will never get the flu if you get the flu vaccine, but hopefully you reduce the acuity and the risk associated with the with the flu, right? And that is the whole point with most vaccines, right? So, so that's why um, it is um, sort of a misnomer and misconception that these are called breakthrough. Um, there could be different underlying reasons and, and medical conditions as to why you might be more susceptible to getting it or not, or even the environment that you might place yourself in or pra safety practices and prevent preventive steps that you could take. So that's why we are still wearing masks in our schools. We're still wearing masks in stores and we are trying to practice as safely as possible to ensure that um, um, whatever you want to call it, breakthrough or not, that you're not susceptible to um, putting yourself in a situation where you um, are infected by COVID. Okay, great, awesome. Thanks for explaining that. Um, I just want, sorry, I just wanted to add that I, I spent some time today reviewing some of the data on the CDC website. And just to keep in mind, even in the face of these break, breakthrough infections, that an, uh, in, in the time of Delta, an unvaccinated person still has five times the risk 
of getting infected with COVID. So we hear a lot about breakthrough infections, but the risk is still five times higher if you're unvaccinated and your risk of hospitalization and death is 10 times higher. And those numbers also apply to, the hospitalization numbers also apply to, to 12 to 17 year olds. So to the, to the kids in this school. So I think there's a lot of focus on um, breakthrough infections and people getting sick post-vaccination, but we need to keep a bigger picture context of the fact that these vaccines are working very well and that the risk is far greater if you're unvaccinated. Yeah, great. Thank you for putting that in perspective. Um, yeah, so I see some questions coming in, but before we switch to uh, HPV, which I know you're itching to talk about, uh, I will just ask you uh, ask a question that Brian just raised, which is also on my on my mind is. Um, flu shots and either vaccination, first time vaccination or booster shots. Um, I think the CDC guidelines is that they don't need to be spaced out and they could be done in the same same visit. For example, is this, um, does anybody have any insight into that? Any, um, should we be worried about spacing at all? Dr. Gies, can I, Gizzi, can I try to see if you want to get, take that one? Well, I, I am not a clinician, so I don't want to comment too much on that. I would, I would advise that people uh, speak to their physicians or pediatricians to see what's best for spacing there. Um, we do yeah. need both of them, um, but it's best to just check with your clinician and make sure that um, that, that timing is appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I will add, though, that um, I was reading uh, just yesterday that the um, public health officials are expecting a double um, I guess double whammy this uh, winter season with the flu and COVID-19. And so they're really urging people to go get their flu shots as early as you can. I got mine today. I hope everybody is able to go get, get there soon. Um, so uh, let's switch gears because those HPV questions are rolling in. <laughs> uh, so I see that a parent had a question about um, uh, the HPV vaccine, um, you know, comparing early early vaccination with two doses versus waiting a little bit and then having to go with three. Um, do you have any, I'm sure you were involved in making those regimens. So uh, what are what's your take on that? I'll put some of those responses in the chat. I did not mean to derail. No, no, no. I think it's yeah, um, if on parents' mind. We want to hear any answer. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy to talk. I'll put some of those answers in the chat. I am going to, I think I want to redirect though, because there's an opportunity here because Meredith is an is a world expert on trend analyses. Huh. And so I think she could really speak to kind of what's going on in Montgomery County, how, how at risk are we, how safe are we, you know, about COVID and about vaccination and how does it compare to the country and the world? And so yeah. I wouldn't want people to miss out on hearing kind of what her take on everything is. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, so I do have a question about how we're doing in Montgomery County. Um, and I, I think we're, you know, we're in a good place. For uh, nearing 90% or across 90% in terms of um, first vaccination. So, uh, Meredith, would you like to kind of give us some what's the picture looking like for us? Sure. Um, I, as an epidemiologist and a parent, I spend a lot of time <laughs> looking at the numbers in Montgomery County. Um, because I think we really need to take the context of the community transmission, you know, it, it, we need to consider that when we're making our sort of daily decisions about how safe we feel in the community. But I will say um, the, the numbers on the Montgomery County website are a little different than the CDC because I think CDC does some adjustments for residents. And if it, with their numbers, CDC has the Montgomery County estimate at 98.7% that of those who are eligible eligible for vaccination have been vaccinated. So you yeah. can't, I mean, you can get better than that because everybody should get vaccinated, but um, we're doing quite well. Um, the national, um, and so that's 98.7% of the, of the eligible and 85% of the total population of the county, because of course we still have our kids, uh, our younger kids are not eligible yet. And then in, the, in that comparison, in the US where it's about two thirds have of, of those age 12 and older have had their vac vaccination, 
and 57% of the full population. So our county is doing quite well. Uh, in terms of um, background transmission, which is measured by uh, a seven day average incidence rate. For those of you who, some of you may be numbers people who are a little bit neurotic like me and are looking at the numbers all the time. And some of you may have never visited the um, Montgomery, Health, um, Montgomery County Health Department's website before, but uh, just for context, where we are right now is about where we were at the beginning of August. So we had an increase in our numbers and now they are starting to come back down. Before that, the last time we were at this rate was the end of April. So we had the end of April, things went way down over the summer and then the Delta wave came and, the, and school started and we peaked around the beginning of September and have, have been coming down in recent weeks. So um, I, I, we're still in a category of what's called substantial transmission, but we are doing quite well as a county and um, as a parent and, and thinking again as about this background rate, I'm hopeful that if we can get our kids vaccinated in the next, our, our, the next batch of kids vaccinated in the coming month or two that we'll be able to continue to have low rates to keep schools and everything else safe in our county. So that's sort of my, uh, for those of you who are interested in numbers, numbers people, there, um, there's a really, Montgomery County has a really nice website that updates in the middle of the day every day with, with new numbers in terms of incidence rate, percent test positive, we're at like less than 2%, which is really good. Um, and a hospital, like percent of the hospital beds occupied by COVID patients and, and all of those, and then vaccination statistics. So people who thrive on numbers like, like Amy and myself, um, that's really helpful way, at least helps me kind of guide my decision-making uh, with my unvaccinated kids. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Rana, I, there's a question in the chat, which I think is right up your alley. So um, the question is about whether you can share more information about vaccination rate disparities. And I know you've done work in this in this area. And so feel free to maybe share share what your experience has been. I don't have the exact numbers, but I worked for the health center program and the health center program um, uh, one of the our, our the biggest populations, uh, some of the biggest populations that we serve are those that are were dispor disproportionately affected by COVID. So, our Black and Brown populations and um, those who do not have necessarily access to care are undocumented um, um, persons as well as migrant health workers. And so, what we have seen is that there has been. Um, a lot of um, um, action to try to really uh, target those populations in ways that are meaningful to them. And this sort of boils down to some of the vaccine hesitancy that we've encountered and why there is this general mistrust of the government, of uh, policymakers, of, of our health officials, right? And it dates back to um, experimentation that was done at Tuskegee University and some of the data that came out of that. And what I, I want to say in terms of vaccine hesitancy, which is really important for us to understand, um, when we are trying to convince our brothers and sisters to get vaccinated, is to truly understand what the data represents and the clinical trials that, that these vaccines have gone through. I know people look at it and say, well, usually it takes two years for vaccines to be approved. Yes, you're right, usually it does, but we've had also 30 years of experimentation on these types of vaccines. And so truncating and putting so many resources and funding towards it within this um, short amount of time um, leads us to these emergency use um, authorizations of these vaccines. Um, in addition, I think there's just this general mistrust and what we have to do as clinicians, as providers, and what I would ask families to do with their own students and their peer groups is use peer pressure that we, we always talk about peer pressure, right? 
There's no better peer pressure, pressure than telling your friend what's the right decision to do when it comes to their health. And so um, let's use it in a positive way and build up and drum up support in order to ask our uh, family members, our friends to get vaccinated and, and, and really try to reduce some of the disparities that we have with our minority populations and those who um, um, don't necessarily have access to care. And I'll just add that we have thought of all kinds of innovative ways to get out to communities, including going, um, having football uh, teams rally the forces in a stadium and do a two-day um, adolescent vaccine um, event in order to get people out the door and get vaccinated. There's all kinds of really creative ideas that health centers and providers have come up with to get people um, to the providers. And conversely, how can we get ourselves out to the communities and how can we talk to our citizens and our undocumented about the best ways um, to, to ensure that they, they get that shot administered and that they understand what the data says and the trends and, and the risk that, that um, we have to our community. Because we have the right to, to be safe and, and these are decisions that are, we're making not just for ourselves, but for our society. And, and, and that's something that we have to be very vigilant of. This is not just a decision affecting you, but it's your neighbors as well. I just wanted to piggyback off of that. And I really liked how you use the term uh, peer pressure. I think that's, ooh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. <laughs> so um, yeah, that yeah. term peer pressure is really imperative. Um, uh, being a black physician, you know, that's something that we deal with all the time is mistrust of the medical system. Um, and I've worked with uh, um, a few other organizations to have town hall meetings to get together and really talk to people about why there's the hesitancy there. Um, so access to care is an, is an element, but if you, uh, have the knowledge, and if you uh, really care about the people in your life, the people in your family, and your community, you can you can be one of those voices to help encourage people to go ahead and get vaccinated. So, thank you very much for that comment. Awesome. Um, and I see that you posted uh, this information about um, the timing of vaccines. I guess the the take home there is that it is considered. There's actually uh, so COVID nineteen can be administered without worrying about the timing respect. Yeah, with I think respect as, to other vaccines. As of now, they're saying concomitant vaccination, go for it. And the reason that they are likely doing that is everything about vaccines again is risk benefit. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So do we delay getting a flu shot? You know, building up those antibodies because it doesn't happen immediately. Getting the COVID vaccine. And in that interim, while we're waiting, possibly getting it, you know, or, you know, or moving forward and getting it. And so everything, you know, about vaccines. And I, I think risk benefit is such a complicated um, topic that, you know, we're not, we as a society are not well trained to think about. But even, you know, so much about deciding, like, you know, should we send kids back to school? Is it low enough risk yet? You know, all this stuff about like, what about COVID? What about COVID? COVID, COVID, COVID. But we really kind of have to offset those risks also with like, what are the benefits, you know, the benefits of school, nutrition, societal, um, all of it. And so I think that, you know, the COVID pandemic has been such an interesting um, opportunity to think through cost benefit, you know, what are the risks? What are the benefits? How do they offset themselves? Yeah. So. Yeah. Great, awesome. Um, I just saw there's another question that I think this kind of goes back to like the basics of how vaccines work. And I feel like this might be a good time to, to kind of address that. The question is about um, getting sick from, or getting COVID from the COVID vaccine. So I think we should put that one to rest. Anybody want to jump in and uh, lay claim to that one? <laughs> So the vaccines now don't have DNA in them, so you can't get the disease from the vaccines. It's, it's impossible. Um, so someone getting COVID after getting a vaccine is some, there's a counterfactual. There's someone who didn't get the vaccine and still got COVID. It, it's a chance, you yeah. know, association. The H, same with the HPV vaccine. They just take a little piece of the shell of the virus and they show it to the immune system. It's not infectious. It can't replicate. It can't, you know, set up an infection, nothing. Yeah. Um, but questions at the individual level, like I had this reaction, should I do
do additional dosing, that is decision making that should be done, you know, with your care provider. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. So let me see if there's anything I missed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the rest were about the HPV. So, and you've answered those, I think. Um, let's go to something that a lot of us are dealing with. I don't necessarily, I have a 12 year old, so I kind of just made the cutoff and both my kids are vaccinated, but I know there's a, there's a significant number of us who are waiting for the authorization for the five to 11 year olds. Um, can uh, Meredith, maybe you want to take this one and see if, you know, talk, uh, maybe talk us through what, what, where those clinical trials are at. Um, and when we might hear about an EUA for, for the younger kids. So um, I can tell you as a parent who's anxiously <laughs> awaiting this, I have had October 26th circled in on my mental calendar since they announced that that's when the FDA would be reviewing, uh, having the meeting to review the data for five to 11 year olds for the Pfizer vaccine. Now I'm gonna, punt to Amy, who already sort of went over this, but there is a process after the FDA meeting that occurs that I hope will occur in short order because I will be taking my kids the day that I can get it for them. Um, but Amy, I don't know if you have sort of an idea of the timeline of like a regular, I, I, I don't recall what it was for the 12 to 15. So if, if I know I it's FDA, CDC. Yeah, so I think it'll move pretty quickly. I think just to talk really quick about the five to 11 year olds, because as you know, I, I have three, two are, have gotten it, one is nine, and I am like counting down the days. Um, that was a trial done in 2000, more than 2000 children. Um, it started, so there's been a series of trials leading up to this to kind of figure out, we call them dose escalation studies, to figure out what the dose is that kids should get. Is it a full adult dose, which the HPV vaccine, there's only one dose and it's for, you know, nine to 45 year olds. For COVID, for this five to 11 year old, it's actually a third of a dose. That's where they understood that the, um, it was inducing enough immunity. And the way that they do these children's studies, and it's the same in the HPV vaccine, what they do instead of doing, you know, placebo controlled trials, because, you know, we need to know, we've, the, we've, we have a high a priori a hypothesis that it will work. Um, so they, what they do is they measure the antibody levels in all of these children, and they compare those antibodies to the adults where efficacy has been observed. And if those antibody levels in kids, even with this third dose, are non-inferior or um, similar, then we can think that that like antibody level will protect in the children too. And so the you know so again, two thousand more than two thousand kids have now been in this in this trial setting of these large trials. Um, safety signals all look as expected. What's been seen for the adults, there's nothing unusual. Um, you know there was. Uh, you know, there's been a few things in kids that have been worried about, or some in some of the adolescents that they worried about in kids, they didn't see any signals for that. So I think it's really all good news. Um, and so those are the data that FDA will review next week, the 26th next week, in a week or two. Um, and again, they're going to look at the safety profile, and they're going to look at the protection. How does the vaccine work to protect? And then from there, as Meredith said, it gets turfed to CDC's ACIP committee. I think they're usually poised to move very quickly. So I really hope it's in a week, but I, you know, they take that bigger picture of risks versus benefit. How much COVID do children get? Hospitals, you know, the whole way through, and then they'll make their recommendations based on that. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so Dr. Gizi, I actually have uh, a question for you that I know, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all obsessed with um, the details about COVID-19 and what it does to the body, how it works and all that. And I feel like in the past year and a half, we've kind of gotten a little bit, uh, I won't say complacent, but you know, bad news, a lot of bad news, we kind of get, you know, a little uh, desensitized, but I, I feel like it's it's a good time uh, to kind of revisit what COVID-19 actually does to the body and does the works in the cells and things. I know you, as a medical examiner, you see 
people are probably at this at this stage, um, you know, who have passed away from COVID-19 potentially. Um, but I, I know you had mentioned that you would be able to speak to that. So I just want to give you that opportunity to maybe kind of, you know, refresh our memories about what this disease is and why it is so deadly. Sure, sure. So I think that's a great question. I think in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were really focused a lot on uh, upper respiratory infections, lower respiratory tract infections. And viruses really, um, as we know, replicate throughout almost every cell in the body, right? So they're going to affect a lot of different organ systems. And I thought this was really interesting because um, a very close relative of mine, I won't say who it is, um, actually got infected, um, well, we think in February, and she had GI symptoms, and she actually wasn't tested for it because it wasn't a respiratory symptom. And that was before we knew a lot about how the virus functions. So it's really important to know, you know, and be diligent in wearing your mask, making sure you wash your hands, you keep things as clean as you can um, so that you don't transmit a virus, um, even if you are vaccinated. So, um, you know, the cases that I've done that uh, were autopsies on people who had COVID, um, I'll just clarify that I'm a medical examiner. So I do non-natural deaths really, or suspicious deaths. So I do homicides, um, suicides, accidental deaths, and then deaths where we don't know the cause and we're trying to find out what happened. So um, the autopsies I've done have actually been on people who died usually from something else, but they also had COVID. Um, <clears throat> so in these cases, you'll see really thick lung consolidation. Like the lungs usually are like almost, I guess you would say like pillows or sponges or something like that. Um, these are completely firm. There's no like oxygen you know, exchange occurring there. So, um, and when you look at it underneath the microscope, you'll see things like membranes that are blocking the alveoli or the small air sacs where that oxygen exchange occurs. And, and you understand why these people are on ventilators and why so many of these um, you know, ventilators were being used early in the pandemic. Um, once we had the vaccine, I think that was, you know, that was really tremendous. We saw that dip in a lot of the um, death rates that we were seeing. And we, we continue to see low rates here, um, not everywhere where uh, not, there's not as many people getting vaccinated but it's really important to encourage those people that you know who aren't vaccinated to, um, to go ahead and get that shot um, and to get the booster if they're, um, if they're supposed to get that um, for their appropriate vaccine. Um, but really with the autopsies, it's just the consolidation in the lung is, is really impressive and just seeing um, how that affects people, even if they have, have died from something else, having that infection, um, you can see how it can be spread to somebody else because it's gonna be you know, throughout your whole entire respiratory tract. And then it really can uh, can affect all the cells in your body because it's a virus. So thanks for the opportunity for asking me that. And um, I think that's one of the, the major uh, things that we want to repeat here is to wear that mask and get that shot. Right, absolutely. I agree. Um, we, we still have a few, a few more questions coming in. And I think one which, um, you know, what comes up in the news every now and then uh, is about long COVID. I know there's a lot of research going on on this and we don't actually really fully understand it. And I know, you know, we're not clinicians, but I'm just wondering if, you know, from your own knowledge or from your reading, if you want to share anything about what we know about long COVID um, and if there's any particular, you know, uh, uh, is there a particular uh, segment of population that's more susceptible? Um, things like that. Yeah, and, and Iran, you know, also long COVID may affect a certain segment of the population more than others uh, from disparity viewpoint. So um, maybe first we can talk about the clinical picture and then maybe talk more about the disparities. Anybody have uh, want to share a viewpoint on that? No. I think I can speak to the long COVID. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, and that's fine. I think, uh, you know, as a panel, <laughs> we, we also want to make sure what we say is uh, is true and fact-based. So that's totally fine. As a fine. parent, I think, I think it sounds really rare and really scary. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about, uh, and I know some some parents have been hesitant to give their vaccine to their 12, 13, 14 year olds as they're going through puberty. Now, um, and I think, you know, that's part of it is um, often they will quote saying, well, we don't know how it works. 
but I'm just wondering, again, I know we were not COVID researchers, but is there, do you all have any insight into that aspect? Like what do we tell the parents who are hesitant because of their concerns about infertility? Um, which again, I'm, I'm not sure it's based in fact, but I yeah. think we should. I'm not an expert. I don't think there is a strong biological rationale. So that's the first thing we want. We're yeah. not just fishing for, you know, weird correlations in the data. And we don't want to look to anecdotes where, you know, one per, you know, I hear a lot as someone who, you know, runs trials, like this person got a vaccine and then they died. I mean, that's a bad example that didn't happen. But, you know, there's also someone who didn't get the vaccine still crossed the street that day and got hit by a car and you know so just because it happened sequentially does not mean it was causal um and i so i think you know we want that temporality we want to understand the biological rationale um you know these vac these trials have been in huge thousands and thousands of people and so far i think in the us they've already given out to like 220 million doses so this, these are the type of numbers that if there are signals and you are, there are vaccine reporting systems in the United States and globally, and they are very like conservative, they're very sensitive. So they will collect more information than is needed to kind of draw, you know, to, to make inferences, to bring up hypotheses that then, you know, we kind of go down in to go a little bit deeper. Um, so I, um, I have not like heard anything that really kind of made me think that it's factual. Um, but as always, I would refer right back to the CDC website, which I can see Meredith put in the chat. Great, thank you, Meredith. Yeah. And, and just to re reiterate that CDC website says there's no evidence linking the COVID-19 vaccine to infertility. And in fact, I believe if you scroll down, the CDC actually recommends vaccination during pregnancy to protect both uh, pregnant women and the unborn babies. So um, there's no evidence of, of the infertility link. Seems to be one of these things that is sort of, was a rumor that perhaps got out of control. Okay, great. Iran, did you were you about to jump in earlier or was that no? Okay, awesome. Okay, um, one question that came up um, in talking to the parents was, you know, we're we're all back. The kids are back to school. Um, you know, there's been the fall sniffles. There's been the cough going around, the RSV, and oftentimes, um, I think parents kind of want to know that. Um, when is the time to go get a test, right? And I think, um, you know, if you're vaccinated, they all, you know, the symptoms may be mild, so it's kind of harder to to really, pin, you know, tell a common cold from of have, having been infected by, with COVID nineteen. So, is there anything that you all are doing in your lives yourselves that you're using as kind of like guidelines to tell, you know, um, at the at the very uh, presence of a cold, do you go to get tested? Like, do we have, are there any recommendations for parents on how to deal with this? So oh, I will take this because it's happening right now in my household. <laughs> yeah. So my son had, had cold-like symptoms and we decided to keep him home, um, coughing, sneezing, sore throat, right? Um, and, and also there are allergies, right? And I know there's a question of allergies that are going around as well. So, you know, to, you know, it's always better to be cautious. You know, we took him to the doctor, got him a COVID test. We did, um, usually now you can get the, the test results back within usually 24 hours, sometimes 48, do the PCR over the rapid, please. Um, and you're, you're usually the pediatrician can turn it around pick pretty quickly, but otherwise you can go to your local pharmacy as well. Um, and I'll say anecdotally, our pediatrician had said that chances are that, um, that if, if you know, you're not running necessarily a fever, there's not loss of taste, loss of smell, like granted, there's all these other a myriad of other symptoms, but if, but if your child is vaccinated, your household is vaccinated, um, 
the chances that it is COVID um, is greatly reduced, right? But it's better to be cautious, especially when we are dealing with a community like our, um, you know, like our school and every and all the after school activities that these kids are involved in as well, right? So you you wait for that test result to come in, and as long as it's negative, that and your child doesn't have a fever and other symptoms that can spread because we don't want we we don't want the virus other types of viruses out there, right? Um, those are some safe practices and steps that you can take. But I think that is probably what MCPS would want you to do as well, right? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, we also had went through this very recently. Um, and the first thing you do is just take them to the pediatrician, call the pediatrician and see if they want to see the child and get them tested. And you can do a drive through at the CVS or do it at the pediatrician's office. But I agree, just the peace of mind knowing that your child or you don't have it. And then also that you have, you're not passing it on to somebody in case you do have it. So yeah, thank you. I want to add one thing as a parent of a, my youngest is three. So for those of you who have kids, you remember that we've been, we, it's been amazing how little she's been sick in the last year, but we're starting to, to get into that like gross snotty nose time, you know, time of year again. I cannot take her to the pediatrician every time. The only symptom she has is a runny nose when I, you know, but because I, you know, want to be sure that she does not have COVID, I do use rapid tests at home whenever my kids have mild symptoms. If she had a fever or was like really ill, I would take her to the pediatrician. But the point of those rapid tests is that they should be able to tell you if, who, you know, if your child is uh, contagious with, you know, has a high viral load of COVID on that day when you give them that test. So um, they're not easy to find. Um, for those of you who are interested, every once in a while, they pop up on walmart.com and they are cheaper there than they are elsewhere. So I have stockpiled a bunch and I know Amy has too. And it just gives me the peace of mind that I'm still keeping her home when she has a, like, has a runny nose. But it gives me the peace of mind that she's not going to give COVID to her sisters or to, to, to anyone else. Um, so the rapid tests are something that I think are underutilized. Again, I'm speaking as a, a, a private citizen and not as anybody in any position of authority. But I think that that rapid tests are underutilized and could really be a great tool for knowing when somebody is contagious with COVID uh, versus not. Yeah. It's so, yeah, I have a couple in my closet too. And we had a weekend where all of a sudden everyone was a uh, snotty mess. And so I didn't think I would need so many, but suddenly I did. But they're just like pregnancy tests. They're super user-friendly. My nine-year-old like loved doing it. You know, she did all the steps. Like who knew we'd need, you know, stacks of these in our, anyways. But yeah, it's, I think it's great to have a couple around. Yeah. Awesome. I know that, um... CVS sells them too, uh, but I agree that they can be expensive if you plan to get more than two. Uh, so some of them are like the ones Meredith, like the Walgreens, uh, I forget the brand name, but they're two for $14. Um, the ones that link to your cell phone, you know, where they track your result are like $45. But yeah. the, the, in terms of the, well, the sensitivity of the result, I think they're quite similar. I don't remember the name. So it's by, the one that I'm talking about uh, that Walmart has is the Abbott Labs version, which is called Binax Now. Yeah. And there are two for $14. Um, elsewhere, they're like two for 25. So, and then you can get the single test there like 40. It just depends on which one you're, you're buying. Yeah. Okay. I just saw that you posted that CDC meetings are open to the public and you can post a question while they're in session. That is, uh, I did not know this. this yeah, they collect questions good. two days before the meeting. And there's also okay. a public comment time also. Okay, yeah. So I guess the, that was kind of in response. There was a question about uh, kids who are just transitioning to be 13 or uh, to be 12 and are going into the other age group where they're now eligible for the vaccine. 
Uh, and I think this is happening to a lot of sixth graders at the moment. So is that, um, um, so how does the, you know, the clinical trials, of course, they're titrating, they're doing one third the dose for the younger kids. And then if you're 12 and older, then you have the other dose dosing. So um, is there, you know, I guess one question is like, my child just turned 12, should I go with the, the lower dose or the higher dose? I guess that was the main, main question. I mean, my answer is go with what the CDC is telling you. Yeah, like because if yeah. not, it's an off-label recommendation right. and you'd yeah. have a hard time getting a doctor to do it off-label exactly. anyway. They yeah. should do, they, your doctor should practice according to recommendations yeah. and there's controls in place to do that. So I don't think you, the only thing you could do is if you have an 11 year old, you could hold them back and then, you know, when they're 12 back, you know, then get them vaccinated. Yeah. Um, but I, I, like me personally, I wouldn't, you know, cause every day that you don't vaccinate is a day you could get it. So yeah. the, the, the second more eligible, we're going. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we're getting close to 820 and you know, we might start uh, wanting to wrap up in, uh, unless you all have anything else you wanted to add. I had like really, uh, and I want to kind of hear your thoughts about the future a little bit. Iran, go ahead, jump in. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a topic that I am very passionate about, which is mental health. Yeah. And um, this is, I, I, I don't know any family who was not affected somehow, right? Whether it was adult or their children during this pandemic. And we saw in the numbers and the data, it's just crushing. Um, among adolescents, it's, it was called, it's been called the mental health epidemic even, right? Where we saw depression rates increase by 30%, anxiety increase by 50%, and emergency visits um, for mental health reasons um, increased by 30%. I mean, and those are staggering, staggering numbers, right, compared to pre pandemic times. Um, and I think that this there was this false notion that our kids are so resilient and they're gonna bounce back as soon as this is over and they're back in the schools. That is not what we have seen, unfortunately, right? There has been a lot of residual, um, um, uh, a lot of residual issues associated with being out of school as long as they have. And, and that's, those are the effects from the, that isolation where they've been away from social settings. And so now you're seeing a lot of kids, especially the ones who are transitioning um, into like from going from elementary to middle or middle to high school where, everything is just completely new and different for them, right? And they are trying to feel their way out socially where they didn't, they didn't, they had a year and a half gap um, of where they were experiencing whatever we want to call normal, right? On top of that, extracurricular activities were out as well, right? They weren't getting outdoor time either. All those have caused all kinds of cognitive issues and, um, um, sleeping problems, memory challenges, uh, and and something that they call pandemic apathy, which I thought was just a, a you know a teenager zone, um, but acting out <laughs> and denial and ignoring consequences, and then acting in, which is extreme hope, hopelessness and not wanting to engage. And what I would say is that now that we have returned back into school buildings that there's still an increased anxiety, even for those kids who got kind of comfortable in the remote um, environment, right? There were some kids who actually did better in a remote setting, believe it or not, right? Um, and, and, and a lot of kids that are back in school have now had to succumb to understanding, oh, we've got to wear the, these masks all the time. And it's, it's a new normal that still sort of keeps us a little bit like hands apart, arms apart, right? From one another to be real humans with, with each other. Um, there's, there, there always seems like this, there's hesitation of like reaching out and really wanting to hug someone, right? And we have to keep in mind too, that some of these children are dealing with grief, have lost loved ones due to COVID, um, and are trying to make sense of what has happened in the last year and a half, which I, in my life, I never thought I would live through something like this. Um, and, and the other thing that I want us to be really cognizant of is that during that time of the pandemic, there was an increased rate of child abuse, increased rate of domestic violence, 
some of these kids have, have witnessed and gone through um, horrible circumstances, you know, being isolated in the home where our school is really the safety zone for, for those types of things to be identified. So what I want to really ask and plead parents to do is know the signs, know the signs. You know, if they're expressing feelings of sadness, hopelessness, um, loss of interest in hobbies and activities, um, they're having physical complaints, like my stomach's hurting all the time, um, changing in, and changes in eating habits and um, um, uh, and engaging in risky behaviors. Like, please, please take that primary step and talk to your pediatrician if you even have an inkling. Um, I know that oftentimes, um, especially um, there are cultural barriers in wanting to seek the help that you need for a mental provider. Please take that necessary step and do so because it could save a life. And um, the other thing I wanted to say too is that we, all of us, you know, we need to be practicing um, citizenry and because it takes a village to raise a child. And that it's not just the encounters that we have frequently with our own children, but oftentimes our own children will tell another adult something that they might not tell us, or another child, or a teacher, or a coach. We all have to be watching out for one another's children. And um, kids also have the responsibility to, to, to telling and alerting another adult when they think their friend might be experiencing any of these symptoms. And the last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, let's, let's take care of each other by exercising community service and the spirit of change, of wanting to come together and helping each other out. We've all gone through so much trauma in the last year and a half, and it's really time for us to come together, show kindness and compassion to one another so that we can move forward and, um, and, and, and really um, have some gratitude as to where we are today. Comment to that. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> um, I want, can I follow up on that? Yeah. Because that's, I think that was so well said. And in that same vein of gratitude, I, I think it's also important that we acknowledge that here in Montgomery County or Maryland or even the United States, like we can get the vaccines when we want them, we can get tests, you know, we we're in a situation, I mean, vaccines are, they should be a fundamental like health right for all, but honestly, they're a privilege. And while we are starting to see some level of normalcy, you know, low resource, you know, countries will not see that for years and years. And so I really think that while it is so hard for us here, and it is, you know, the acknowledgement that, you know, we are consuming a disproportionate number of the vaccines compared to the global community. Um, and, and, you know, the COVID will be felt outside of this country for years and years. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite sobering, the numbers. Um, and, and I'll just turn to Meredith really quickly. Uh, speaking of numbers, I know um, there was just a recent study comparing <clears throat> vaccination rates in Africa and parts of Asia with that in, you know, in Europe, even Eastern Europe compared to Western Europe and, and the US. Uh, since you have been looking at numbers a lot, I'm just wondering if, you know, uh, what kinds of trends are they hopeful? Like how, how are you seeing these data? Um, there's no crystal ball, but what, what, what kind of timeline and prediction are you, do you have any? Yeah, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even try to guess at something like that. Um, as Amy said, the and Amy knows a lot more about vaccine distribution globally than I do. That the you know we're very fortunate here in their parts of the world where things are just going to take a really long time. Mm -hmm. I would also say that overall, you know, for us, for uh, my family, for this community. I feel very hopeful that we we are turning a corner and have turned a corner, but COVID is a, a tricky virus and you know we've sort of been fooled before. So I, I'm I'm hopeful that um, that things are, you know, once the next batch of kids gets vaccinated, things will be much better here. Um, and we just hope that we've done enough to vaccinate to prevent another mutation that's going to cause something like Delta again. 
All right. Um, any other last uh, last remarks from anybody else on the panel? Uh, I think I just wanted to, say, to yeah. say that you you sum, earlier you summarized that really beautifully to, about taking care of one another, and um, you know the mental health aspect of it is really really important. At my office in DC, we've seen rises in all different types of cases, unfortunately, because um, because of all that's going on. So I we can't stress enough really to take care of one another and encourage your um, your community members, your family members um, to get vaccinated, to make sure they wear their masks. Um, Cause I know many of us have lost friends and lost loved ones during this pandemic. So we need to make sure that we support each other mentally as well. Okay. All right, with that, I just wanna thank you all very, very much. Each one of you provided unique perspectives today uh, on topics that were, you know, we're not clinicians, but I feel like as parents and just part, uh, members of the community, I think each one provided a really unique perspective. So I want to thank you all for taking the time, um, post-dinner family time and spending it with us. I appreciate, really appreciate that. Um, and then I'll hand this off back to Brian. Brian, did you want to say anything to close the meeting? Uh, I just want to thank you all for participating and, and, and sharing your expert opinions and uh, both your expert opinions, but also as parents. So do appreciate it. And Shruti, thank you for facilitating. And thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. We'll see you at the members meeting. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye.